Good morning. Uh, welcome to the joint uh, CS Network Systems Seminar. Our speaker today is Professor Daniela Turinetti from the University of Illinois, <coughs> Chicago. She received her PhD in Electrical Engineering from ENST Telecom Paris Tech in 2002. She was a postdoctoral student at, in Switzerland, uh, EPFL, 2002 to 2004, and she has been at University of Illinois, Chicago since 2005. Uh, she has received Best Paper Awards, uh, NSF Career Awards, uh, University Scholar Awards. She has <coughs> held various numerical uh, editorial, I'm sorry, responsibilities, and her interests are limits of wireless interference nets, coexistence between radar and communication systems, multi-relay networks, and content type coding and cache. And she's going to talk to us about that last topic. Let's give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. So it's my great pleasure to be here. It's my very first time in Irvine. And coming from Chicago, especially after the polar vortex last year, uh, last week, it's really nice to be here. Um, <laughs> so this work is uh, part uh, of the PhD uh, thesis of Kai Wan. That uh, so this is uh, back in Paris in uh, last summer, um, during uh, at the end of his defense. So and these are the collaborators. This is myself. Pablo Piantanida, who was a co-advisor of CHI, and uh, uh, our other collaborator at the University of Utah, uh, Professor Ming Wei Chi. Um, as uh, Ender said, um, I'm from Chicago, the University of Illinois <coughs> Chicago, UIC, a permutation of UCI. Uh, we are almost in downtown uh, Chicago. That's the view from our office, so this is the downtown area. Our office is a couple of miles from there. And um, if you uh, have never been to uh, UIC, uh, here are a couple of reasons to come and visit us. Uh, I'm with some other colleagues part of the UIC NICEST lab. That stands for Networks, Information, Communications, and Engineering Systems Laboratory. And the group uh, has myself. I work in information theory mainly. Uh, Professor Smida, who does physical layer communications. Julia Seferoglu, an alumni of uh, UCI, uh, who does networking, and Natasha De Roy, who also does uh, information theory. And if the nicest group at UIC is not a reason enough to come to Chicago, our campus is also one of the best examples in the world of brutalist architecture. And I'm not going to comment on what that means. <laughs> it's self-explanatory. So today, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, two uh, topics that I've been um, working on with Kai and some other uh, students uh, lately. I'm going to give a very high level talk because I understand this audience does not necessarily uh, know too much about uh, in information theory. If uh, something is not clear, please uh, interrupt me and ask questions. The point that I want to um, make with today's talks is that there are uses of codes uh, that are kind of uh, different from what you might have learned in, say, in your uh, digital communication classes. So codes have been usually studied and proposed to correct errors uh, introduced by the communication uh, media. Uh, the way we're going to use codes in this type of application, in particular in caching and uh, data shuffling, is to um, make sure that uh, information can be exchanged in an efficient way between nodes who do not necessarily have the whole information available to them. So we are focusing on noiseless problem, but where the information is distributed. Okay. So let me start with coding caching. The motivation. So caching is something that has been used uh, a lot uh, and is implemented in networks. And the main idea is to move content closer to the users, so that. Uh, that can be accessed much faster, so reducing latency, and especially because you don't want to burden the backbone network with uh, a lot of requests for content. Okay. So um, this problem has been uh, very recently, say five, six years, been looked at from an information theoretic perspective. 
because it has emerged that when you look at networks of caches, then there is something interesting, some interesting phenomena that is uh, emerging. And uh, the motivation for actually looking at that, say, from a moral and physical layer perspective, is that uh, there are applications like videos that are making up most of the uh, data uh, traffic <coughs> on the networks. Those applications, these video type of applications, are uh, different from voice and uh, um, voice type of uh, communications. In particular, content is uh, produced ahead of time. Um, there is uh, not all videos are equally popular. Some are more popular than others. So a few of them make the bulk of the demands. And the, the time at which they are watched is also highly predictable. On, at the same time, devices are becoming mobile devices, if you can think of. Uh, a lot more powerful, they are able to uh, make <coughs> more and more sophisticated type of operations, and uh, they can store uh, data uh, locally, and storage price is uh, decreasing. So caching, in the way that we are going to look at in the next couple of slides, tries to leverage those features of, uh, say, video type of traffic, um, trying to use local storage and local communication capabilities to diminish traffic during peak, up, uh, peak traffic times. The idea is to store content locally and then deliver what is missing by using codes. So there are different versions of the problem uh, uh, that, have been, that has been studied in the community. I'm going to present here the uh, simplest version as it was proposed by Madhahale Nizen. Uh, back in, so their first conference version of this work appeared in 2012, if I remember correctly, uh, published in the Transactions and Information Theory two years later in 2014, and awarded the best paper award two years later. <coughs> so the model uh, is, is simple. We have a server that um, has a library of n files, and all these files have the same distribution and they have the same size. There are k users and users can store up to m files. So you can have a library say of 10 files, n is equal to 10, and each user can store one and a half such files locally. So the uh, a caching problem uh, has two phases. In the placement phase or prefetching, some content from the server gets placed into the caches. At this point, we think uh, that the only constraint is really the size of the cache. So we're not going to count you know, the cost of storing that information in the caches. <coughs> also, uh, this uh, placement in the caches is done without knowing what the users are going to request later on. Also, the content of the cache is going to stay fixed. Okay, So this is uh, an offline caching problem. So once the placement is done, the users, each of the users, is going to request one file. And the demand vector is going to be indicated by the letter D, where D1 is the demand for user 1, D2 is the demand for user 2, and so on. So once the demand vector is known, the, the server is going to broadcast packets through the network. And in this particular case, the network is a noiseless channel. So whatever the sender, the server transmits is received uh, error-free and distortion-free by the users. Um, the size of the broadcast transmission is going to be indicated by R. Again, it's a multiple of a unit, uh, of file unit. And uh, the goal is to be able to uh, design a system which includes placement and delivery in such a way that this rate, this load, is minimized. And the minimization uh, is uh, for the worst case scenario. So we are looking at all possible demands, and we are looking at the one that requires the largest amount of communication. And we are trying to uh, reduce this by designing placement and delivery phase. Now, the delivery can depend on the demands, but the placement cannot. 
the formulation of the problem clear? Thank you for the thumb up. Okay. okay. So let's uh, give a couple of examples to see uh, you know, what could be done. So this is an example in which there are two files at the server and there are two users. Each user can store only one file. Okay. So let's look at, say, a traditional way of uh, using caches. Uh, because the cache can only store one file, you can think of taking the two files, dividing them in half, and store half of each file uh, in, in the cache. So file uh, A, the red file, is going to be split into two parts, A1 and A2. Both, both users are going to cache part A1. And similarly for the green file, file B uh, is going to be divided into two parts, B1 and B2, and part B1 is stored at both users. So this is a kind of a replication of the content. The caches are the same. Now, uh, once the caches are uh, filled, requests are coming in, and say that uh, in this particular example, uh, one user wants the red file, and the other user wants the uh, green file. So in order to satisfy uh, these uh, two users, these two requests, the server has to broadcast the pieces that are missing. So it has to broadcast piece A2 to satisfy user 1 and piece B2 to satisfy user 2. So it has to transmit twice half a file for a total of 1. So everything here is in multiple of a size of 1 file. So with this uh, replication and encoded delivery, the load on the network is equivalent to 1 file. So the question is, where, is whether we can do better than this. So this would be uh, filling the caches without thinking that there is a network of cache, and you're just uh, looking at each cache individually. So this is more of a traditional uh, way of thinking of uh, cache systems. So this was the observation done by Madhahali and Nizen that actually we can do better than that. So in this particular case, they show this uh, toy example. So it's again uh, two files, two users. Each user can store uh, one file. Again, we are going to split the two files in half, but now the content of the caches is going to be different. So user one stores the first half of each file, and user two stores the second half. So now the cache contents are different. Okay. Uh, once the uh, placement is done, requests are coming in, and let's assume again that one user wants uh, the red file and the other user wants the green file. So user one has the first half of the file, but is missing the second half. The second half that is actually available at the other user in the cache. And similarly, uh, user two uh, wants the green file. He misses the part B1, which is, all, which is available at the other user. So the server, what the server can do in this case, instead of sending first the first piece of the green file and then the second piece of the red file can actually combine them together. So imagine a list that has strings of bits. The server can XOR them together. So this is an XOR operation. So A2 plus B1 is still a sequence of bits that has the size of half a file. Okay. And it's going to transmit this over the broadcast link. And now with this multicast coded transmission, both users are satisfied. So let's look at user one. User one has A1, wants A2, but it has B1. So it can take the multicast, the XOR packet, remove B1, that is known, and recover A2. At the same time, user two can subtract A2 and recover B1. So with one transmission, we have been able to satisfy both users at the same time. And because one transmission is useful to two users simultaneously, the load on the network has been divided by a factor of two. So what this is pointing out is that when you have a system of caches, you should try to uh, place the content in such a way that multicast coded opportunities arise. 
because when you can mix the information together, then you can reduce the communication load. Please. Do you assume these two users make the request at the same time? In this particular version of the problem, yes. People have also looked at uh, asynchronous requests. So if I'm they, having... Yeah, the if they make the request at different times, then you cannot do the X or because they, they need it at different times. Yeah, so what you can think of, instead of looking at a file, say, as a whole movie, you can think of chunks of a file or of a movie as files. Mm -hmm. So you just want, you know, short enough units, and so then you synchronize the transmission of those units. So the, um, so the main point of the paper of Madali and Nissen was that if you have a system uh, that uses the classical replication and uncoded <laughs> delivery, you have a baseline broadcast rate that has this form. Uh, so M is uh, the amount of storage, N is the number of files, so you can store M over N of each file locally. And so the rest, the fraction one minus M over N, has to be delivered. And because there are k users, this is the rate that you would have to deliver in this uh, traditional system. Now, if we can use this uh, idea of doing uh, multicast network coded delivery, and we can, com we can, in one transmission, we can satisfy g user, then the rate would be this baseline rate divided by g. And I use the letter G because this is what we, uh, is referred to as global caching gate. Okay? So the larger you can make G, the more you reduce the rate on the network. And what has been shown by the Madhali and Nissen is that this multicasting gate G is actually growing linearly with the number of users. So in, um, in particular, what is interesting is that this and it's called global caching gain because it depends on the aggregate memory in the network, so the number of users times the size of the memory of each user. And so k over k times n divided by n essentially represents how many times you could replicate the whole database in your network uh, if all the memories are kind of put together. So the larger this number is, the more gain you can have, the more opportunities for network coded transmissions you have. And so they show that this linear scaling in the coded caching gain is possible, which, if you put this as the denominator of that expression, both numerator and denominator will depend on k. And as k grows to infinity, so in a network where you can have an arbitrary large number of users, the number of transmissions <laughs> will always be finite and bounded. So this is an amazing scaling. There is no better you can hope for, really, than being able to satisfy any number of users by, at most, a constant number of transmissions. So this is what really uh, ignited the enthusiasm of the community to try to understand whether this kind of gains can also be realized in other type of networks that are less idealized. And the answer is yes. I'm not going to go into those details, but such gains are actually achievable when you have noises and other uh, impairments. Yes? Um, where does the M over <coughs> So n is the size of the memory, and n is the library size. So you can think that you can fill your uh, memory by uh, allocating an equal fraction of it to each file. So m over n is the amount of space in your uh, storage that you are going to uh, give to each file in the library. Okay. <coughs> Make sense? This assumes that uh, all users are in the same network and it's possible to broadcast all of the multicast, right? Absolutely. But if they are distributed uh, around Earth and it's like one person requesting from Bob from one side and the other one is on the other side, they're not going to be in the same network. So you would have to actually like double the uh, amount of information that you have to send to each person. Uh, that's an excellent point. And indeed, people have looked at cases in which uh, users may change during the, the, so here you have two phases, right? You have the placement and the delivery. Uh, here it's everything is kind of synchronized, but what happens if those set of users is different over time, or it might be, you know, like in one phase you have more users than in the others. So there, there are people have studied that. Uh, it's called the uh, decentralized version of this problem, and similar gains are uh, possible even in that case. 
when you say the rate is bounded for all k, are you assuming um, the number of files n is bounded? So here, uh, I'm just taking that expression and I'm keeping the number of files and the memory size fixed. So uh, the rate is at most number of files divided by memory size. So those are considered to be you know, fixed and finite. I'm just letting the number of users in the system grow. So if the number of files is fixed, then the rate would be bounded anyway, right? Even if you extend all the files, because it's not scaling with the number of users. Okay. Um, that's a good point. So uh, an underlying assumption is that there are at least as many files as users. So, so n is increasing with k then, right? It could be, yes. So then this would not be bounded then. Um, the, I will talk later about what happens when you have uh, less users than files. No, yeah, when uh, n is larger than k, and we'll see that there are still multicasting opportunities and that can be. It's good, people are paying attention. Okay. Okay, so this is the slide with the most math. The one thing that I wanna just point out it's because it's something that I need to uh, comment about later on. So there is this parameter T that represents the, essentially how many times you can copy the whole data set in your network. So it's K, the number of users, times N, the memory of each user, divided by the size of the library. And let's assume that this is an integer, right, for the time being. So the way the scheme works is that each file is split into k number of users, choose t, this parameter pieces of equal size, and then these pieces are strategically placed in the caches of the users to make sure that uh, you can have these multicasting uh, opportunities. The delivery phase is a simple binary linear network code that combines these different pieces, and uh, in the end, um, we are creating uh, multicast messages that are gonna serve T plus one users. And we are trying to serve all possible subsets of K users of size T plus one. So the rate <coughs> that we are achieving is K choose T plus one, how many things we are sending, <coughs> divided by the size of each piece. And so uh, if you put everything together, you get exactly this expression, the baseline rate divided by the multicast gain of the system. But remember this K choose T factor because it will be important later. Okay. So if we plot the, uh, the load as a function of the memory size, so this is an example from the Madal and Nielsen paper for 20 users, so 20 files, sorry, and 10 users. Uh, we see that there is a very steep decrease in uh, communication load by having a little bit of memory. So what this is telling us that you know we don't need to have a huge memory available at the users, but just being able to store about uh, two files per user is going to divide by two the rate uh, needed for the delivery phase. So this is the linear part of the load. There is followed by a non-linear part, which seems to be curving a bit. And then once your memory is about at least half the size of the uh, library, then again it's uh, like a linear linear function. Now these two extreme points are clear. So if you don't have any memory at all, you need to uh, transmit the minimum between the number of files and the users that are requesting files. And if you can store the whole library, you don't have to transmit anything. And in between is a decreasing function. Now, uh, in the paper by Madahal and Nissen, they uh, showed that this scheme is actually optimal to within a factor of 12. So, you know, they could not really say what is the optimal scheme, but by using information theoretic arguments, they could say a load that is smaller than something is impossible. So this is a converse bound. And by taking the ratio of that converse bound with what they could achieve, they could show that, you know, you, uh, you could not do better than, you know, take whatever they can achieve in rate and divide by a factor of 12. So what is important here is not this factor of 12, is just the fact that there is no further scaling of this uh, broadcast rate with the parameters in the system, right? So somehow this, uh, uh, this um, scheme is capturing the, the essential part of the problem. 
So when we started to be interested in the, in the problem, we actually were trying to figure out is whether this system, is this scheme, is actually optimal in some sense. And so we developed uh, a converse and impossibility result by considering all possible uh, placement and delivery strategies in which the placement is encoded. So is you take your files, you chop them in some way, and then you place the pieces in the uh, caches, and then you try to do the best possible by using codes for the delivery. And we could, we found a, a, a lower bound on the right that looked very much similar to uh, the, what the Madalianism scheme does, but there is a, a reduction, uh, a little <coughs> reduction in the rate. And so what we could prove is that this term is actually zero whenever the baseline rate is smaller than the number of files. So what this is saying is that if your baseline rate is bigger than the library size, you don't even need to use caching at all, right? You just transmit all the library. But when that's uh, not the case, then uh, the Madalianism scheme is actually optimal. So there is no other way of using codes for the delivery that could do better than what they had come up with. Now, uh, after our work, uh, the group of uh, Madalena and uh, Avestimer, they actually proved that our lower bound is optimal even in the regime where you have more uh, users than files. And even more interestingly, they proved that if you don't restrict yourself to uncoded placement, the scheme is optimal to within a factor two. So what it says is that if you wanna do better, you really need to use codes not just for the delivery, but also for the placement rates. And if you do so, you come up with schemes that are, some are available in the literature, are a lot more complex, but they could give you at most uh, a factor two in gain uh, in rate. Which is, I don't know, disappointing, but also good news. You know, we have a scheme that is relatively simple and is almost optimal. Okay, so let me give you a proof by example that you can reduce the number of transmissions uh, compared to what the Madalianism scheme uh, did. And this was the key observation in the paper by uh, you, uh, Madalian, and Avestimer, is that when you have intrinsically in the system multicast opportunities, then some of the linear combinations that were uh, designed by the Madalianism scheme are redundant. So this is an example with four users and two files. So there are more users than files in this system. And so if we do the Madalianism scheme with where everybody can store half a file, you would split each file in four pieces, and then you would transmit six linear combinations. Now, the math is not really important. The, the key <coughs> is that you can identify between uh, these uh, five linear equations, one that is linearly dependent on the other. And so you don't need to send that, because by receiving the others, the users can just <coughs> reconstruct that one. And so what they were able to do is actually to identify and count how many of these linear equations we were linearly dependent. And so you don't need to send them, and if you don't send them, you save in rate, and this is the best possible scheme you can do. Uh, also, in general, it's not optimal to put place uh, content uncoded in the, caching, in the caches. So this is one example, again, four users and two files. So this, so this kind of a, a phenomenon are uh, important when either you have more users than files or your memory is small. So this is an example with four users, two files, and each user can store a quarter of each file. And so in this particular example, one can see that if we split each file into four pieces, each piece is already a size of a quarter. So we don't have enough space in the caches to store two pieces of that. So instead, we can think of XORing them and store that XOR combination in the cache. And so this is a coded placement because we are doing linear codes also for the placement. And then one can come up with another simple uh, linear network codes uh, to see that uh, it's possible to serve <coughs> the users while in quotes also decoding the cache content. And you can do that by using less transmissions than uh, 
previous scheme. So in general, we know that we can do better by placing content coded in the caches. However, the schemes that are available in the re literature are really uh, are more, almost kind of case by case, and the gains that they <coughs> provide are not so substantial. So uh, from my point of view, this vanilla version of the problem is solved because we have a scheme that is general and is optimal to within a factor two. So this would be a plot to show, you know, the blue line would, uh, would be the Madal and Nielsen scheme. The orange one would be the one where you uh, don't transmit the redundant uh, uh, network coded combinations. And so you can go from blue to orange. If you do coded stuff, you go from orange to uh, the black dotted line. So you gain a little bit when the memory is, is really small. And the yellow line is an outer bound that uh, takes into account all possible type of placements, and you see that you know we don't need any uh, coded placement. We are essentially uh, at the at optimality. So the factor two is really a worst case, but often it's much less than a factor two. <coughs> okay. So the main point is you need to <coughs> spread your content as much as possible through the caches because you want to create multicast coding opportunities to get a high global caching gain. You want to use network coding for the delivery of the messages. Uh, and if you do so, you can be optimal within a factor two. And uh, it seems that you are able to uh, serve a lot of users with a number of transmissions that doesn't really grow to infinity. So uh, that going back to the question that was asked uh, before. So actually, uh, you know, for <coughs> this to be true, besides the way you let K and M scales with one another. Um, the problem here is that in order to get those, uh, those gains, those scaling gains, you need to split each file into a lot of pieces. And because you are splitting each file into K choose T, so T is related to the caching gain, global caching gain, this grows exponentially with the number of users. So this is called the sub-packetization problem, and it's uh, exponential things grow too fast, so you know files that are as big don't exist. Uh, so the question that is still open is, what if we limit the number of splits that we can do in a file? So the subpacketization level is bound in some sense. How much can we gain? Can we still gain? Right. So that is not totally clear. Uh, it has schemes that reduce the subpacketization level to still exponential, but in the square root of the number of users they are known. But it's not clear whether, you know, well, there are some impossibility results, but there are some restrictions to those impossibility results. A true converse bound that says, you know, with these many uh, splits in the file, this is as much. You cannot do better than this. This is a type of result that is still missing and will be very nice to have. So we know how much we can gain from this type of schemes. Okay. Any questions on this before I move to the next topic? Yes. Are these codes appli applicable to the peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks? So there are versions of this problem that are called distributed in which the, the users communicate with one another so they can only transmit things based on what has been cached. And there are results there, and global caching gains are also uh, attainable in this case. You need to transmit more because <coughs> it's a distributed scenario. But yeah, so there is still uh, there are still gains. Uh, there. They're using these codes too. Like similar, very similar code. codes. So the next problem, I'm actually going to talk in the kind of peer-to-peer -peer distributed uh, fashion. So you will see how it works. Can these be extended to other erasure codes than combinations of bits? Uh, so the, when people uh, started to think about the sub level, so they um, looked at codes on larger finite fields. So they, uh, and they build codes on such fields, especially also when you think, if you're thinking of doing coded placement, those are usually uh, on higher fields. So codes are uh, more involved in this. Okay. But in this 
version of the problem, this very simple binary code are enough. Yeah, so a lot of variations of the problem have been analyzed, you know, decentralized, asynchronous demands, non-uniform demands, online caching, general network topology, difference in file size, in cache size, with secrecy constraint, with noise on the channels, with dynamical networks, with stringent uh, decoding delay constraints. All these have been looked at. And in all these cases, there are still global caching <coughs> gains might not be as large as what we saw today in this uh, simple model, but all this has been looked at and the message that you should do this kind of spreading content as much as possible by creating multicasting opportunity, this is still the message uh, with all these more realistic uh, assumptions. Okay, so my next part is a problem that has uh, some resemblance to caching, but is motivated by uh, distributed applications, computing applications. So we live in the big data uh, era. So we have these uh, huge data sets that need to be processed, but there is no single system, unless you wanna spend a lot of money on a supercomputer, but even there, yes, it's not really true. Um, these data sets cannot be stored in uh, a single machine and definitely cannot be processed by a single processor. So we need to come up with schemes in which we can distribute the data and each worker, each server, each processor is gonna do local computations and then possibly exchange this intermediate results to come up with the final uh, answer. Now, uh, in algorithms such as, you know, you're training your neural network uh, and you're running your stochastic uh, gradient descent, then it has been noticed that workers which are just um, computing on a subset of the data, uh, the algorithm goes through iterations, it has been noted that if from every few iterations, if you refresh the data points that each worker is working on, the algorithm converges faster. So this part of exchanging data points in the middle of uh, your uh, computation is called data shuffling. Now, data shuffling involves communication between different processors or different servers, and this may sometimes be the bottleneck in terms of execution time for your algorithm. <coughs> so, uh, one question that has been asked is that, so this shuffling data is useful, but takes time. So is there a trade-off, or is there a best way to shuffle data in this type of uh, applications? Uh, also, it has been uh, observed that codes can be used not just to reduce the communication load in the shuffling phase, but also to make the system robust to strugglers. So when you are doing your computation in a distributed way, not all servers are gonna finish at the same time. So you need to wait for the lowest one to finish. But you can use codes and redundancy in the computation to uh, make sure that you don't have to wait for the lowest one. So codes can also be used in this way, but I'm not gonna talk about this use of codes in this particular talk. <coughs> okay. So the, um, the, the, let me walk a little bit second. So the, the uh, data shuffling uh, problem is as follows. There is a master node uh, that has uh, N files or N data points. And there are K workers in the system and each worker has a local storage that can store n uh, data points or files. And here the assumption is that the, the number of data points, n, is k equal the number of users times an integer q. In other words, each of those workers has to work on a subset of q data points. Okay. The uh, computation occurs in, uh, in stages, in epochs, in time slots. And at each time slot, um, the, um, the master node is telling, um, wants to reshuffle the data between the workers. So it tells each worker which new batch of Q points that worker has to work on in the next iteration. And then it's gonna um, uh, transmit data in such a way the workers can recover the points they need to work on at the next iteration. And based on that transmission, the workers have to update 
uh, their storage to store those points because they need to compute on that data. So uh, in the data shuffling phase, a new assignment is uh, broadcasted. So A1T is the set of assigned points to user one at time T. AKT is the set of assigned data points to user K at time T. The master node is gonna broadcast something at time T in such a way that each user, based on the transmission and the content of the cache at the previous time, is gonna recover the files that have been assigned to it. Also, uh, the files that have been assigned, once the cache has been uh, constructed for time T, the files that have been assigned to that user must be stored in the cache. Okay. So this is as kind of uh, a flavor of caching, but the difference, this is one of the major differences. You cannot just store pieces of all the files as you wish. Some files, you need to have them all in your memory because you need to do computations on them later on. Okay. So this kind of breaks the symmetry of the caching problem that we saw before. Now, if the size of the uh, storage is bigger than the number of points that uh, the users have to operate on, this extra storage space can be <coughs> filled as they wish. So the cache is logically two parts, one in which you need to store all the points you need to operate on entirely, and the rest, in orange in this figure, in which you can treat that as a cache in the same sense that we saw before. So you can store a bit of everything of the rest that you don't need to operate on. And why would you wanna do that? Because you wanna uh, have enough information, so to speak, locally, such that the master for the shuttling phase can do these multicast network coded transmissions to limit the amount of information that needs to be broadcasted in order for the worker to update their cache, their storage. Testing? Sure. What's the assumption about the computation here? Is the, is the expectation that every worker has to see every data item or every all the data, or is it that the computation is additive or whatever, okay. uh, partitionable? So actually, because we don't want to make any such assumption, the, um, the goal of this problem is to find a scheme that uh, minimizes the worst uh, communication rate um, and worse is with respect to all the shuffles. So then it doesn't matter you know, whether you need 50% new points every time, if you need to change them all every time. Because we're looking at the worst case shuffle, we are kind of considering all sorts of computations. So it's a worst case type of performance. If you fix the shuffle, so if you tell me in advance what will have to be changed, it can, you can do better than what I'm gonna describe next. But then you restrict yourself to a certain class of Five minutes, oh, I saw the other five questions. <laughs> okay. um, so the version of the problem that we looked at uh, is the one in response to one of the questions before, where there is no master node, and the workers have to uh, uh, exchange. Uh, so once the new um, shuffle uh, is communicated, they need to exchange information locally. So in our version of the problem, we need to minimize. So we're looking at the sun rate, and we are gonna look at the worst case with, effect, with respect to all shuffles, and we try to find a scheme that minimizes that worst case. So notice that here we have two things that are kind of different from caching. One is this kind of asymmetry in the way you need to store files. And also here, it's more an online caching type of system, because after the shuffle has been communicated, you need to update your cache. So you need also to decide what to throw away from the cache to make space for uh, what will uh, you will have to store. Okay. And so, um, let me just use, in the, for the interest of time, in the paper by uh, Atia and Tangon, um, they came up with uh, achievable scheme, so the red line, uh, and converse bounds, the blue line. In general, uh, the, these two don't match. Um, this um, achievable scheme, was really inspired by the caching scheme that we just looked at. Before, uh, 
tweaked in a way that you can accommodate for this asymmetry in the way you need to store files and also to make the uh, structure of the cache um, kind of the same over time so that you can do the cache update easily. Uh, the gap between, the multiplicative gap between these two curves is two in general. And actually the gap can be completely closed if one fuses instead of these simple linear combinations a la Madalian Nissen we talked about before, something more involved that um, has to do with interference alignment. And if you want to know about interference alignment, you have a world-renowned expert here in the audience who will be more than happy to answer questions about interference alignment. So if you use interference alignment type of ideas for the delivery phase, then you can achieve in the centralized case, uh, the blue line. <coughs> so what we did, we analyzed the decentralized version of the problem. We came up with converse bounds. And uh, interestingly enough, so one of the questions we were interested in is how much worse your performance is in terms of communication if you need to do your operation in a distributed way. And we were able to quantify the cost of distributed uh, of peer to peer communication by something that is of the form k number of workers divided by k minus 1. So it's interesting and uh, a good news to see that if you only exchange information locally among your workers, then at most you need to send uh, twice the amount of information that would have been sent by a central server. <coughs> but this information is local among nodes, so might not create a bottleneck uh, in your network. Uh, now, by looking at our converse bound, we have some sort of sense of what is the kind of schemes we are looking at. And so the way the scheme seems to, the way schemes should be designed, and we have designs that uh, follow this philosophy, is as follows. So there is a parameter n, which is the equivalent of the t in the caching. So this means how many, so each user has to store a batch of q points. So M represents how many such batches you can store at each uh, worker. And so um, each worker has to use uh, one such portion of the memory for its own files. But the M minus 1 remaining can be used for kind of caching in the, in the like what we did previously, right? So the idea is to take each file and look at all the users, which are k minus 1, who can store that file in the extra storage space, which has, was parameterized by m minus 1. So you split each file into these many pieces. Um, now, because each piece is available at m users, each such piece is further split <coughs> into m parts, and each local worker is responsible for one such piece. So if you know, m is equal to 2, two users will have the same file, uh, say me and uh, Enner. We split that piece in two. I'm responsible for the first half, and you're responsible for the second half, so that we don't uh, send you know, redundant things over the, the network. So this takes care of the denominator. And the numerator says that the amount of information <coughs> that each user needs to send is a few times. This is the size of the batch. Uh, k minus 2 choose m minus 1. So this has, um, reminds us a little bit of the type of linear combinations that uh, we need to do for the uh, caching scheme, but it's actually smaller. If you believe me, if you remember the, the formula before, it's not exactly like this, which points out to the fact that there is something else that we need to do, and in particular, we need to do this interference alignment um, uh, business. Now, what is difficult here is that let me skip this example, but only give uh, <coughs> this final one. So what is difficult here is that this interference alignment uh, has to be done in this distributed way. Okay. So this is, again, a proof by example. So this we have four uh, users, four uh, data points. Each user has to work on one data point at a time and can store two. So. Uh, so let's assume that at a given time, um, so the data points are called ABC, and that um, user one has to work on point B, user two on point A, user three on point B, and the last user on point C. 
So they have to store in their cache all the files they need to work on, plus the equivalent of one extra data point, or five. So each file is divided into three pieces, because there are three users that can store it in the extra storage space. And so, for example, user one has to store completely file D. But a piece of it can also be stored at uh, user two, a piece at user three, and a piece at user four. So file D is split as three equal size pieces, D2, D3, D4. Similarly, the second user has to work on piece A, so it has to store all the file A, but some of it can also be stored at user one, some of it at user three, some of it at user four, and so on. Okay, so here for example, the storage of user two has all the pieces of file A because it has to work on file A, plus all the pieces of the remaining files that have subscript two. And so three pieces is one file, other three pieces is another file. They have stored two data points, two files. So now this is the cache at uh, time t minus one. And let's assume that we have a cyclic shift of the, of the data points. So now user one has to work on A, user two on B, user three on C, and the last user on D. So if you look at, for example, what user one has, has it needs the three pieces of file A, it has already one, so it needs the other two. Similarly, uh, each other user will have already one piece of information stored and needs the remaining two. So we can think of constructing a code that uh, circulates these eight pieces of information among the users, the workers. Now, let's look at user one in particular. So user one, has already the pieces that have subscript one in the cache. It has all the things that have an A in the cache. And, uh, no, sorry, it wants the things that have uh, A in the cache and has D, because it was working on file D. So this he needs, this he knows, and this he knows. So of these eight pieces of information, only two are really interference for and so ideally, what we would like is to kind of consolidate these two pieces of interference in one dimension. So that user one does not see the piece before and the piece C2 individually, but only through a linear combination. So this is what we call alignment of the interference. And each user, and we would like to do this for each user, but we need to be able to do this align in interference business in a distributed way. So user one can only send things that depend on its cache content, okay? And similarly for the other users. So in this particular example, for example, user one can uh, send, so we are looking at the things that need to be circulated. He has D3 and C1, so he can linearly combine them, and this is what he's gonna send. Similarly, the other users will combine two pieces of information and send them to the network. So once the users have received these four tran transmissions, they can subtract everything that has been that was cached. So if we look at user one, the transmission that is done by itself is useless because these are things that he knew already, right? So they don't need. So this that's why there are these uh, dashed lines. By looking at the transmissions of user two and user three, these are these two pieces that he's interested in. B1 was known, B2 was known. So by doing uh, interference subtraction, he can get two pieces that he wants. And interesting enough, the transmission of the last user has this aligned interference that I was talking about. And what is interesting is that for all the users that is the case, one transmission is useless because this is what the user sent. Two of them are useful because they deliver the two pieces of information that they want. And the last one contains the aligned interference. So this, in a way, is the best thing we can hope for, right? Because one transmission will always, whatever the user transmits cannot be useful. You need to count how many things the user wants. And so you need at least this many transmissions. And then you need at least one other thing to align everything that is rubbish for that user. 
So these four transmissions is really the minimum possible you can hope for in such a scheme. And it turns out, in fact, that this is the optimal scheme. So we can generalize this idea, but only for um, large storage space. So the users need to have enough locally stored things at this point to uh, be able to do this distributed interference alignment, alignment business. But this is really what would be the, a major difference uh, in data sharpening compared to other schemes. So to conclude, um, for this part of the problem, we see that you know, there are potentials of using coding for alleviating the communication burden in distributed computation systems. Uh, in addition to all the kind of questions that we saw for caching, including the self-packetization problem, I think what is really interesting, and this is something that we are working on in my group at the moment, is how to do this uh, interference alignment in a distributed fashion while guaranteeing that you can decode and you can update your, uh, your storage uh, online at the same time. And also another interesting stuff that may have application for supercomputing is that you might want to look at other connectivity among the users, among the cores, among the workers, because it's not necessarily that everybody talks with everybody else. So uh, is it still possible to get these gains if now you can only communicate to a local area? And with that, I think my time is up. Thank you. Okay, thank you.